Hello, I'm Brian Winka, Director of Sports Turf for Advanced Turf Solutions. I'm Greg Munchaw, Director of Agronomy for Mountain View Seeds. Uh, today we are filming this in St. Louis, Missouri, which is right smack dab in the middle of the transition zone. And uh, one thing we know about the transition zone is that uh, we've got a really diverse climate here. It's really hot summers, really cold winters. And so growing any kind of grass well is extremely difficult. Uh, too hot for cool season grasses in the summer, not good recovery because they're just not growing. And the reverse is true for warm season grasses in the wintertime. As you get into fall, they're not recovering from traffic. And as they go dormant, they're certainly not recovering at all. And they're getting pretty beat down during the wintertime. And so this is a trend that has been going on for decades and decades across the transition zone. If you're growing one kind of grass or the other kind of grass, cool season or warm season, you're struggling in one time of the year or multiple times of the year, depending on what you have. And it's just not something that long term makes a whole lot of sense. And it's really tough on turf managers. Obviously, the stress levels for them personally is high when these grasses aren't doing very well. And so today's uh, conversation is going to be based on Lumuda, which gets around these issues of uh, growing one grass only and uh, hopefully brings the strengths of the grasses together to, to cover or compensate for the weaknesses of the grass. So this is not a new idea in the slightest. This mixing up different species of grasses has been going on probably for centuries, really, uh, in naturally in the environment. Certainly we see weeds in the transition zone where we see uh, Bermuda grass as a weed in a cool season stand, very, very common. Um, and then uh, as turf managers, we have brought in ryegrass most uh, commonly to, uh, to cover up some of the, uh, maybe the not great points of Bermuda grass. Uh, and to give us a good uh, stand. The, the ryegrass overseed has been kind of successful for a lot of years, been used on Bermuda grass stands uh, from the southern United States up through the transition zone for a long time. But thinking about that, you know, it doesn't make a ton of sense when we're planting every fall, buying seed and planting, and then every spring we are spraying chemicals to take that ryegrass out. Then with dry, might come up great. It might be full and solid. You might be happy, but then in the spring you're turn right around and you drop a chemical on it. Which once again, there's a chem one less chemical, but you drop a chemical on it. And like I said, you want that right to be there through the play, but you're so late into the summer by the time that play's over that you're behind the eight ball to try to get your Bermuda back in there. So it was just a constant battle. Before I took over the the actual maintenance uh, of the fields. We, were ho we would host 60 summer games at least in the summer. Well, so to backtrack a little bit, well, the first summer we did it, we killed the rye out like you're supposed to. Well, then the field looked not presentable um, because it was early in the summer. The, the Bermuda hasn't, hasn't really hit its, its stride. So we're like, this is a, we've got to find a way to make this field look better. Well, then we kept the rye in until the 4th of July. So the field looked better, but then when we spray, sprayed out the rye, then it really damaged our Bermuda, and we would get we could get it back to full coverage before school started for our season in the fall. But then it was so thin, you know, you would wear it out in spots, and then you're either having to resod or or just go with it, basically. So back as early as the 1950s. Researchers at the University of California, Riverside, did some work where they looked at mixing Bermuda grass and Kentucky bluegrass specifically. Prior to that, there's there's evidence of people looking at some other cool season grasses and warm season grasses, but specifically Kentucky blue and Bermuda grass, where they said this looks like a good option for Southern California for using the the two different grasses to give you that uh, the color year round and something that's going to be growing. So they had this idea, but it's not something that lasted. And then come around to the 1970s at the University of Maryland, same idea. And they put out some information where they were looking at using Bermuda grass and Kentucky bluegrass to 
um, get that same same idea. Both areas I would consider the transition zone climate. And uh, but again, from the, the late nineteen seventies in Maryland, this is not an idea that took off. So fast forward thirty years or, or whatever, and there's a saw producer in Italy that is having some issues lifting Tifway Bermuda grass. It's not holding together for him. And so he thought, what can I do to hold this together? That's his only thought was, what can I do? And he didn't want to net it or whatever. And so he threw a little bit of bluegrass in to try and hold this saw together. He was very successful. About that same time, Roger Crenshaw, who was with Ehrenberg at the time now with Advanced Term, Term Solutions, uh, saw this in Italy, came back and started kicking this around and ended up writing a paper um, on this idea of mixing Bermuda grass and Kentucky bluegrass because he thought it looked pretty good. While this is all going on, Brian Winka in St. Louis is dabbling with the same idea. So what were, what were you seeing? What were you seeing? So what I was seeing was I was kind of on the same uh, Bermuda ryegrass you know, program and and then I had even transitioned to trying to leave a perennial ryegrass in there. Just the predictability of it, there's not a lot of success trying to grow those two. So I had, you know, a sales rep came by, hey, there's this newer bluegrass out here, you know, went through the approved genetics, the, the wear tolerance, you know, all the pros that, that were with that. And, you know, the discussion we were having was to add this bluegrass into my cool season baseball fields. But I, I decided, well, I'm going to put it on one of my soccer fields, on my Bermuda soccer fields, and I just want to see, I just want to see what it does. I was just curious. So that first fall, and it, it, it came up, but it really didn't spread, it didn't really do much. I didn't think much of it over the wintertime, and then uh, the next spring, it, when it came out, you know, and started growing again, it, it looked fantastic. So that kind of is where the wheels started spinning for me. Um, How did it look going through to that first summer? So it, it, it performed really well. Um, you know, again, I was still just kind of trying to figure out what I had there at that point. So, um, so to say that I, you know, my intention was to go out and, and make blue muted fields at that time. Like it's, it was an accident at some point, and, but I liked the results of what I was seeing. So then I dug into it a little bit more. Um, I sat through some presentations at STMA on phrase mowing, and then um, the, the people out at the Maryland Sports Complex did a seed to, to play in 35 days using you know newer bluegrasses, better, better genetics. And uh, so I kind of took those two concepts together that following year, we phrase mowed two soccer fields, and then we interseeded the, the bluegrass into them. You know, that's at the same time, and then started growing those two together. Um, started having really good results. Um, you know, now I had to figure out how I got this mix together, how do I manage it? So that's where the mistakes I had originally was trying to manage it as a warm season field in the summer and then a cool season in the spring and the fall. Um, so we made some mistakes fertility wise that we learned from, you know, we backed our inputs down. Um, but I had worked with Dr. Brad Friesenberg from the University of Missouri. Um, you know, so after a couple of years of having this in, he, he's the one that really kind of encouraged me, hey, we should tell some other people, you know, it's not supposed to work, but it is working, it looks really good. We should we should start telling some other people what, what you're working with here. And then that's kind of, you know, you and I met at an STMA event, and you know, I, I, I told you, you know, hey, what do you think of putting the two grasses together? And you kind of looked at me a little bit, and. Uh, but uh, you know, every time I give the talk, I say the guy was nuts. And um, I, mean, I thought it was, a, I seriously thought it was a dumb idea. I really yeah. did. When I was in school, I saw ryegrass left in Bermuda grass and the Bermuda grass just getting thinner and thinner yeah. and thinner yeah. over the years if it was never taken up. And that's all I could think of with the bluegrass is that, you know, they're not going to play well together. They're, the bluegrass is either going to just die off because it's bluegrass, right. or it's going to do like the ryegrass and it's going to thin out the Bermuda grass. There's no way to me that this would work. But the thing that kind of intrigued me about what you said to me at that STMA meeting was it had been working for you for several years in St. Louis. And at the same time, we had gone through the polar vortex in Kentucky 
And I had dead Bermuda grass all over everywhere. People called me about it, I had it on the research farm, the whole deal. And so I thought, you know, if there was a cool season grass in here to kind of hide that, you know, so you're, you might get some, some death of the Bermuda grass, but would you even notice it if you had the bluegrass in there? Or would it be a severe of, of a issue? Right. And that's kind of essentially what I was looking for was having a more predictable stand of turf. Not necessarily, you know, a predictable Bermuda or bluegrass, but I knew that every spring that when I came out and, we, and play started on our, at our facility, I knew I was going to have a solid stand of turf where when we had ryegrass, you know, putting the ryegrass into Bermuda and then you spray it out to, and you think that you might have 70, 85% coverage and you spray that out and you're like, oh, I only got 50% coverage or, or maybe even worse after an event like a polar vortex. So um, that, you know, I keep coming back, that predictability is really what I was looking for as a, as a manager at that point. Right. I think there's particular applications uh, for situations where perhaps you've got a spring dead spot issue in a Bermuda grass turf. And uh, if you don't have the resources, budget, ability to apply uh, expensive fungicides in that preceding fall, then uh, a blue muta system is going to improve the footing and playability of that turf. I came up and saw it that spring in 2015. And as you said, Dr. Friesenberg from Mizzou was already involved in it. But that summer I touched base with him, you put us together, and Mike Copley at Virginia Tech, and the three of us, including Chesterfield Sports Complex where you were working, we all got together and put out the first trial of Blue Moon across all these locations. And uh, the, the study that I put in in Lexington is still there, yeah. and it still looks ridiculously well. With very little input. I haven't done it well. Yeah. See, I don't get right. right. no, too good. But, but yeah, I did very little to that trial over the years, and it and it stayed looking really well. Yep. Um, and so I went from thinking you were nuts to thinking maybe he's not so nuts. Um, it could be bold, but I mean. <laughs> uh, but but uh, so it was interesting, and it got a lot of attention because you know we had this issue with. In the transition zone, we've got grasses that just don't perform by themselves, and now here's grasses that maybe together are making the other one better, or the stand together yep. better. And so, um, as I started, our first trial was a fertility study, just seeing how much fertilizer, what what source of fertilizer might do well to get these things to grow in. But I showed this trial at our field day the next summer. After having not done nothing, period, I just put the original fertilizer on in the fall, did nothing up until July when the field day was, and they looked amazing. People coming by to see this thought, you know, this is old Riviera Bermuda grass that I planted into, and it was striping up, it was dark green, it looked great. We could see differences in the fertilizer trial. It was amazing how good it looked. But then this is the first time I'd ever grown Bermuda, and right. I did nothing to it. I didn't water it ever, not a single time, and I didn't fertilize it again that year, period. And so come that next fall, what are you supposed to look like? Probably not so good. Not yeah. so good. So, it, but it looked, it, it was thin, and I was like, well, this is, compared to overseeding, this looks horrible. You know, I feel like I need to go back out with a whole bunch more bluegrass, and reseed this completely. But again, I did nothing to it. I did put some traffic on it that fall though, even though it was not a whole lot of grass there. But uh, come the next spring, guess what? Bluegrass everywhere. Bluegrass everywhere. That's, that's what's kind of the interesting thing to me. Uh, when you were playing with this stuff originally, were you seeding every year? Were you, what were you doing? So we, we did the original where we put, this, put it in there. And so what we did was we went from seeding the entire playing service on a soccer field or football field to maybe just, you know, up the middle goal boxes. So we reduced the amount of seed that we were putting out every year and feel like we had to because we had the same same thing. We looked at it, the spring, it looked fantastic. Um, through the summer, it almost looks like bluegrass vanishes. And then as the fall comes back, you really start seeing how much bluegrass is still in there. So. You know, there's really no reason to oversee the entire playing surface when it's really just a really, really high traffic areas that need it. So that reduced our, our cost and our 
in our labor as far as how much we were having to overseed. So, um, so yeah, long story, no, we weren't overseeding everything the same way that we were in years past. I went, I came in here with about 75 to 100 pounds that first round. And then this year I had to use about a half a bag to hit my little thin spots. You know, I come in with a little hand spreader and then hit all my little thin spots. Uh, and I did do a slight general overseed over the whole thing, but I hit my light spots heavier. Um, now with my soccer fields, I came in pretty thick and aggressive with it. I, I dropped 200 pounds right off the bat and called it good. And it was, it, now granted, it was the whole facility there, but yeah, it was, bam, I had it big, perfect. I had to do very little overseeing this year. When he came up and looked at it, well, I mean, I'm in year one. And it was like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> you're not going to have to do much, you know. So now my overseeding's down to minimal. I know it's a little pricey up front cost to buy that good seed. But once you get established, you know, to continue to overseed, I mean, your amounts has gone down. I'm thinking next year that it, it I will do very little, if any, next year. You know, I'll be so thick and green, and uh, then now I'm not buying any seed. So, would you've seen that same issue where there's maybe not as much bluegrass in the fall, what do you tell somebody, especially at the collegiate level? Yeah. So, so yeah, depending on what levels, because we have run into that. So, in a in a, in a situation like that, a higher level, or maybe you're on television, um, yeah, I would introduce more seed um, that fall. So that matters rates. the first fall. Yes. What about subsequent falls? So will, will should it come back and be and look like a ryegrass overseed that next year? It should. Yeah. So you, that first fall, if you if you're doing a fall planting, you'll put it in. Uh, the blue will come up, but it just kind of lays there. You know, um, goes through the winter time and then the springtime is when it. From my experience, from everything that I see is the springtime, you know, I typically will get a phone call late February, early March, soil temperatures are still low. Hey, I don't think this is working. Three, four weeks later, soil temperatures start warming up, we get some good sunny days, and now there's bluegrass everywhere and we don't have any issues. So that's that's been my experience is that it's a it's a process. It, it's it's not that instant result that you get with a ryegrass overseed. It it's it's a long-term goal, not a short-term success. I, guess. I don't remember. I, I planted like in August, and I already had. We had a nice, we had a nice warm fall with a, an ample amount of rain, and it came up like that, and boom! And as soon as I seen it up and going, I knew I was in business, you know. So, and then that spring, when it came, when then whenever spring come around, see, I already had results going into winter, and I was like, if it's doing this now. I can't wait till spring. Spring came. It was exactly what I was expecting, and boom, I had coverage. I mean, in soccer field, same thing. I told them, I said, "There's going to be a transition period. We're going to have one season because I have girls in the in the fall and boys in the spring. So we're going to have one season that it's not going to be the great. We're going to have to hold off. You know, hopefully some of the bluegrass will come up. You know, it didn't softball, and and luckily it did. We had some. It wasn't a total brown field going into you know the end of the girls' season." And then, so I said, the spring will be in business. Same thing. As soon as spring came along, boom, it was up. We were off to the races. And then the Bermuda climbed right in on its backside. Bermuda had no trouble, you know, combining up with it. And they blended well. And so that's, that was my success. You think it's we're at two and a half years since the first time we started. Um, and... And, and this is what this is where we're at now in, in about two two and a half year time frame. So, <clears throat> I mean, I would complain to my sales rep and uh, be like, "Man, what are we doing here?" But you just you know, I'm not complaining to him now. Um, so you've got to have some patience um, with it, and it's not an overnight thing. Um, which that's what because that's, this isn't my industry. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, I'm wanting this thing like that. And it, it's been a, a process of, I keep saying process, but you have to be on, you just have to stay with it um, and be patient and, and trust what you're doing is gonna get you the final result. The establishment of Blue Muta, I think people sometimes don't understand that it, it does take a couple of years. It's not just something that is gonna happen in one year. And that's exactly what I've seen too, is that 
Uh, the first fall, you're probably not going to fall all over yourself excited about how good it looks. And then depending on what I've seen with, with all the, the blue moon that I've grown over the years, if you've got an extremely hot September and you're not watering a whole lot, your bluegrass is going to be delayed coming back. Yes. But if you can, if you, well, if your temperatures are fine, it's the bluegrass is going to start filling back in probably well before the Bermuda goes dormant. But if it's extremely hot, what do you think about water management to help the bluegrass along? Yeah. So I, obviously, an irrigated field, this is good, this is going to work better on. The more moisture you can give it, I guess, for establishment, the better, the quicker that's going to establish for you. Um, I've seen it on. You know, non-irrigated areas, and it just it just doesn't do nearly as well. Some of the newer bluegrasses that are out there. Yes, they will germinate seven, ten days, but again, they just kind of lay there. You know, they don't spread and fill really, really fast in this system. But they're there. They're they're getting established. They're laying that groundwork for the springtime. So it's a again, it's a long-term goal. So you have to have a different mindset going into it set the expectations with, you know, if you got coaches or administration that's used to you doing a ryegrass overseed and seeing that dark green every fall, set that expectation with them, let them know what you're doing, show them the long-term goals. So let's talk about the establishment process of it. What, what would you recommend for getting it going, seeding rates, seeding timing? Spring, fall, all those things. So, I, so I've done both spring and fall plantings. Um, I would say I think fall is probably your, your best bet for success. Um, kind of that two to three pounds per thousand range is my typical um, recommendation. Um, so some of the establishment is going to be based on what type of breed you have. Um, some of my fields that I had, the original ones that went in, it was on quick stand, older variety, more open canopy, easier to get the bluegrass down into the soil and get established. Uh, some of the other fields that we did that were um, latitude, and we did a couple that were north bridge, newer varieties, tighter canopy, harder to get that seed down in there. Those are the ones that we actually did some spring plantings on where we did the phrase mowing. We got down to essentially bare dirt and interseeded into it at that point. So uh, the key is getting that seed down through that mat layer, the thatch layer, get it in the soil and, and get it growing from there. But that two to three pound slit seeding works great. Um, I've seen dimple seeding work. Uh, I've had a couple guys go out with, again, older varieties, more of the quick stands uh, where they've just air fried and, and broadcast. And um, I was really surprised it, it how well that worked for a couple of people that I work with. So. I've also observed that the best blue mutas are typically in some of our more open canopied uh, Bermuda grasses rather than the ultra dense one. And I think that makes sense. I've worked on tight canopies, newer, newer varieties versus some of the old open ones like Quicks that I've used out and used Riviera. And on some of those open canopies, I didn't have to do anything. All I did was broadcast seed, brushed it into the canopy, and it came up great. Yep. Did the exact same thing on the newer dense canopies, very, very little bluegrass. And so what you do pre-plant, depending on what kind of grass you have, matters. For yes. sure. Also seed rate, I, I'm with you completely on the two to three pounds, you know, which is basically a bluegrass rate yeah. anyways for just establishing a new field. You don't need, we've gone as, as high as five pounds in studies, and you don't need it. Right. It doesn't benefit you in the long term. It doesn't establish any quicker. It doesn't, you know, there's a, a, that diminishing return. So you're spending a lot of money for which you really don't need. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but vertical mowing or phrase mowing, especially phrase mowing in the spring, I don't know that I would recommend a whole lot of phrase no. mowing in the fall, no. hurting the Bermuda grass. Uh, we've also planted, had a lot of questions about this early on, can you put down Bermuda seed and bluegrass seed at the same time and call it good, you got Bermuda, you know, in the bag. Right. And the quick answer to that is it was a huge failure. So in the spring, Bermuda would germinate and go, and the bluegrass would, in the fall, it was the opposite. The right. bluegrass would go and the Bermuda grass would do nothing. And so there, we just couldn't get uh, both of them to work uh, uh, right planting seed at the same time. 
And so typically what we're going for here is a stand of Bermuda grass that we thin out and then plant the bluegrass into. Have you done it the other way? Yeah, so um, I, I do. I still, I think the, the better option is to start with a Bermuda base and then add the bluegrass, but have used 100% um, bluegrass base Interceded uh, was Riviera at the time um, into that and had success doing it that way. Um, I still think starting with the Bermuda base is the better way to go, but you can reverse essentially reverse the order and do it that way. I, I prefer the Bermuda base. Right. So yeah, me too. Absolutely. Uh, so depending on where people are in the transition zone, that will dictate timing of planting. Just just like with a cool season field, anyways. But uh, you know, you may be best to plant late August, or you know, if you're southern transition zone, you might be better off waiting until mid to late September. Yeah, it just totally depends on where people are. If yep. you've got that, what you need is the, the warm ground, but not extremely hot, where the Bermuda grass is going to be dominating. And so we want uh, the the bluegrass temperatures to be right before it gets too cold, because as soon as it gets too cold, it's done with you. Yeah. Well, I think, I know I saw it, and you know, I think we've talked about it before, two years ago, we had an extremely dry, droughty fall, and saw some issues there, you know, kind of get back to that water management, where people were putting it in, and, you know, that following spring, that, that stand of bluegrass was just really weak, and, you know, I think everything we looked at was, it, it was water management on that initial establishment. So, again, an irrigated field, with this is going to help that process. Yeah, absolutely. So all your early plantings were with HDT bluegrass, correct? Correct. Okay, and so you had a lot of success with that. Yes. And so that's when, when I started doing my research, I was working with HDT as well and had great success. Great grass, it works in this situation. Yep. Uh, great grass, period. Yep. As I was going along with Blue Wood over the years, Mount Seeds came to me and said, is HGT the only bluegrass that will work in this situation? I said, I don't know. It's the only one that I've ever used. Yeah. And talking to people over the, over the years around the country, there have been other bluegrasses that have, have worked and have been used. Uh, but to that point, HGT was the only thing that had been used. And so I put a study out uh, in 2016 with uh, Mountain View and looked at 10 of their bluegrasses and HGT in the same study and found that... Uh, um, they had some, some blends in there that, that did very well um, against HDT. Um, and there were some grasses that perhaps just didn't work. work. Yeah. They might, might be great blue grasses, but in that situation, in blue would mixed with the Bermuda grass, just didn't work. And so what we learned from that trial was uh, uh, really interesting. Some blue grasses are great, some aren't. And uh, from that, 365 SS from Mountain View has been released and has been used an awful lot in Lumura yep. because it's done, it's done well. It's comparable, I'd say, to HGT. Similar characteristics. Yes, so I work with both um, personally and you know now on this side being a distributor. Um, and I've seen it work with both. So I do think um, not every bluegrass is going to work in the system. We know that these two varieties, um, they do work. They've proven that they work with this system. So. I, I do think it's the newer varieties, the improved genetics so, so of, of both of those um, is kind of the key to this system. And I think aggressive, you know, blues. aggressive blues, heat tolerant, good traffic. Ability to withstand low mode weight. Yep. yep. So all of that, and, and, I, and I think that's been the key of why some of these other earlier attempts of putting these two together just didn't work. The blue wasn't aggressive enough so i do think that these newer varieties are they're kind of the key to this system working now the main reason why i think this system warrants continued exploration and utilization is the improvements in the genetics of the kentucky bluegrass it's just within the last five years uh, the, the quality of bluegrass turf here in the transition zone during our uh, warmest summer months the quality just continues to be uh, quite striking uh, for now, uh, you know, more than a handful of cultivars. From that trial, I went to another one looking at it. I had 50-some different blues and fescues in Blue Muda that I was evaluating for. Do they work or, or don't they? 
And from that, I can tell you about maybe maybe 65% of new blues will work in this. Okay. So yeah, so not all of them are great, great uh, options for it, which is interesting. It, it makes it tough to recommend seed because you know, you, it's just not a blanket. Okay, yeah, use bluegrass. Well, there has to be specific ones. There's some great ones out there that not, not ones that we've mentioned, um, but and there's some experimentals that may or may not get released that did extremely well in that study that I did. Right. Um, but yeah, not released yet. So, you know, it all comes down to does a grass produce enough seed to make it to yeah. market? Yep. Uh, so we used HGT uh, and uh, again, the same thing, the, exp the, the recommendation and the testimonials, uh, they fit with what we're trying to achieve, which is the best facility we can have. Well, I've, I've been using HGT for quite a few years, uh, you know, pretty much since it, it came out. Uh, I think the reasons why I use it is it's, uh, it, it's quick establishment. Um, and as I said before, the 365SS, I had heard uh, the, you know, some good things about it. So I chose uh, the 365 SS uh, because I had heard good things about the color. Uh, color is outstanding. Um, I wanted to see how aggressive it was versus uh, the HGT. Uh, though it's not quite as aggressive, it does have much, much better color. Um, I think that uh, in terms of if you're going to establish a blue muta field, uh, you, you might get a, a more balanced mix if you were to go with 365 SS, only because it's not quite as aggressive as, uh, as the HDT. We had a lot quicker germination with the 365 than the HGT. The HGT is a little bit more of a process, or for us, a point. I mean, to me, it repaired, they repair the, themselves the same. The color, the 365 is darker, than the HGT, but I mean, we're not on TV, so it doesn't, like, that's not that big of a deal for us. The durability is, I think, equal, pretty much, uh, of either variety. Play, again, the playability, the durability of both blends it is, I think, really high. At that point, it just comes down to either your budget or what color preference you like, I think. In all of my trials that I did, Except one, I did three quarters, and that's what I was mowing at. You know, on my fields year round was that three quarters of an inch. You know, the crazy thing is, I hear people mowing as low as four hundred, yep. uh, half an inch, five eighths, and having success. It frightens me when somebody's mowing down to half an inch in southern transition zone in very hot areas. What's going to happen to that bluegrass? My my fear is that it's going to stress it out too much. Yeah. Um, that's always my fear too, but you know, I, I see some of the newer blues that are out there at professional stadiums. You know, again, it's not apples to apples, but you know, they're mowing it that year round and that's a straight bluegrass field. So, you know, I, I would think within this, this system, it, it should work. Um, you know, again, I was at three quarters of an inch. I was in a park and rec facility. I, I thought the fields played perfect at that height. So uh, I didn't feel like I needed to go down to that half inch, but I, I think if somebody has to, I think these newer bluegrasses had that ability to, to do that and survive. Right. And yeah, we can see that all over the country. Well, on the flip side, you can also go higher. There's a lot of places that are mowing at an inch, an inch and a half. You know, that inch and a half, that makes a nice blind surface. So you don't necessarily have to have a real mower mow down tight to make this work. No. All right, so if we're, if we're thinking about a high school or a parks and rec type situation where budget is a concern, they can't spend a whole lot of money. Um, they may have not been using ryegrass in the past because of the expense of it. Would you think Blue Muda is an option for these kind of people that uh, don't have great budgets to, uh, to manage the grass with? I think it is. Um, so what I saw, and we were, you know, that traditional ryegrass customer, and when we transitioned, um, you know, you're, you're putting bluegrass there's that initial upfront cost, and then your yearly cost is going to be significantly lower because you're putting less seed out. Um, but you're going to have a more predictable field, especially in that early springtime. So you're going to have less repairs, whether it's sod or sprigs. Um, our fertility, 
we lowered our inputs. We're using more slow release fertilizer, so less inputs going out. Um, fungicides, we were really, you know, I think my last two seasons managing, we didn't spray a fungicide all year long. So it's really as a as needed basis on that. Um, so we reduced inputs and I think we gave a better product on the field. So I definitely, you know, that's one of the things that I tell people in recommending this system is, you know, it's a sustainable system. Yeah, you're going to save money on your budget and you get a high quality field. So to me, that makes sense, especially at a parking rec or high school level. Right. Yeah. So I agree completely that uh, if you can get by the first cost of the bluegrass seed, you're going to have a better stand that's probably going to use less inputs going forwards than if it's especially bluegrass by itself, yes. but even Bermuda grass by itself. Yep. And then if you have issues like spring dead spot in the spring or winter kill in the spring, uh, you're not, those aren't as big of a deal. Correct. You know, you're, you've got a grass to be able to fall back on and, and play on. Uh, you mentioned fungicides. During all of the years that I grew Blue Moon in Lexington, I didn't spray a single fungicide on it. So people always ask me, summer patch, you know, isn't that a big concern? You know, with a straight bluegrass field, it is a concern. But I think because you've got two different species growing side by side, any disease I don't think can spread like, yeah. like wildfire, yeah. wildfire that, 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 uh, like they normally do. Uh, and so I just never saw the disease. I never saw pressure enough to spray. No. Same here, and, and that's another thing with the you know the newer varieties of bluegrasses we're talking about. You know, some of those are bred with the genetics where you know spring dead spots not, not spring, summer patch isn't really an issue. Um, so there there is a better disease tolerance on these newer varieties that are out there. And I and I think that's another benefit to the blue Buda is, is uh, disease pressure is almost zero. We rarely see it. Uh, if we do see it, it's not it it's not uh, you know severe enough to warrant treatment. Now on the cool season fields, obviously we have to we have to put down. Uh, I try to do it monthly, but sometimes it's a couple times a month. Uh, put down fungicides to help control pythium and brown patch, summer patch. Uh, those are our main ones down here. So my well, one problem that I run into sometimes would be annual bluegrass. That first fall, I would get annual bluegrass coming up, and then I did a lot of wear studies with traffic simulators over the years. And if I really beat the plots down in the fall, like football type traffic, um, sometimes I had them thin enough where some annual bluegrass would come in. And so, what, what's your experience with annual bluegrass? And what so, did you look? Yeah, so again, um, some of this goes into the planting and, and your varieties of bluegrasses that you pick. Get a, a good variety. That's a clean variety. Um, you know, one of the one of the customers that I work with now, his first attempt going out, they bought a um, really economical bluegrass from a local co-op, and you know, looked like he planted poa at that point. So, um, well, there are chemical options out there that you that you can go out and you can spray and get that poa under control, and then you know. There's guys that do pre-emergent in the fall to make sure they're not getting anything uh, coming up that next spring. So there, there are some management options out there. Um, you know, but I think that making sure you select a good variety of bluegrass that's clean out of the bag is going to really add off a lot of the COVID issues. And, and to, like you mentioned before, the more aggressive blues, if you can get more bluegrass established that fall, there's less there's chance less. of pull coming on. So I saw that, uh, the, the, the grasses that did better in this big study that I did with some different uh, grasses in it. Um, if they didn't do as well coming out of the summertime and stuff, they were thin and they did some pull with them. If they would come back quicker, like these new aggressive ones, they were, they were very successful at uh, keeping the, the poa out. Yeah. But I also saw every spring, yeah, I might have had some poa in, in different plots, but um, poa obviously just can't take the heat. Right. It's going to melt under eventually. And so sometimes I just said, we did some chemical uh, control on, on poa, but we also just let them naturally transition from, you know, go to sea, whatever. And usually in year one, I would see a little bit of poa, 
But then, as I got my sand thicker and thicker over the over the years, by year two, yeah, I didn't have those sand. Yeah, you don't see it. Yeah. Not saying that it's not there, but you, it's just you don't see it. You don't notice it there. Goose grass is uh, the the single biggest uh, nuisance when it comes to you know control on a Bermuda field. It's there's really not a lot of products out there. There has to be a level of uh, um, you know you, you're gonna have to accept a level of in injury. Uh, with some of these products to, to in order to have success with controlling it. Um, you know, to suppress, uh, I think I've used MSMA, uh, Dismiss. Uh, we have tried a little bit of Pilex at lower rates. Um, I wouldn't say anything completely eradicates it. It, it. it won't completely go away, but you can control it. As the blue's gotten thicker, um you know, definitely to the back end uh, of where we're at, you know, I, I think the weed, uh, we've seen less and less weeds. The biggest thing for me on the weeds is we, your high traffic areas. Weeds I only see now kind of in that areas that are the most compacted wear areas um, or the most overuse areas. If you're interested in doing this, you know, how do you choose bluegrass? Well, you choose one that you know is going to work for sure. And, uh, yeah, for a concept that is becoming more in the box, but is still somewhat out of the box, you know, I, I think if you were going to go and convince somebody to do this, why not use one of the varieties that's proven and has worked and has had good results? As of twenty January 2021, the, uh, the two that have worked extremely well have been the two that we've discussed a lot today. Yeah. Let's talk about fertility. Uh, fertility has been the part that I, especially early on, struggled with a lot. When to do it, what products to use, uh, rates to use. Yep. I, I thought, you know, I've got a bluegrass here that I don't want to get more than just a three or maybe four pounds total on. Then I've got a Bermuda grass that I'm used to, used to putting down pound per thousand per month on during the summertime, when do you apply right. and how much do you use? And so how did you figure that out early on? Uh, by making mistakes. Okay. I mean, essentially, you know, same, th same thought process. So when it got hot in the summer, I was like, well, you know, we throw our ammonium sulfate half pound every two weeks. We're going to really get this kicking. And um, so by doing that, we really over fertilized the blue that was in there. And, you know, we lost some blue that first first year. Um, so the next year we went in and kind of dialed it back, um, got away from the quick release fertilizers, um, started to use some of the extended release, a um, lot of foliar feeding, and then, um, you know, even some of the organics that are out there. So really completely flipped the way we were growing the grass instead of just pumping it and, and really getting it going, we slowed it down. Um, what I saw by doing that, it, it seemed that our grass was healthier, held up the traffic better. So I think because we weren't pushing it so fast and you weren't getting things to elongate, you know, I think the cell walls were able to hold up and, and sustain that, that traffic on it. Um, so it felt like we built a, a better field at that point. So I wasn't necessarily concerned about well, I need to feed the bluegrass this month and the next month I'm going to feed, you know, the Bermuda grass. And it, I was just feeding the entire field is kind of how I looked at it. So, you know, as far as pounds per year, that's where I do closer to that three to four, you know, more of that bluegrass range as far as when you're fertilizing. And, you know, again, uh, was fortunate to have, have a sprayer. So if you've got the ability to spray and kind of spoon feed it, through that the summer months, you know that's where I've seen the, the most success. So I'm not a liquid fertilizer kind of guy, and so I didn't do a whole lot of that spoon feeding that way. But I'm certainly a control release fertilizer proponent, and saw a lot of success with putting down a encapsulated product that would put out fertilizer over a long period of time. Yep, and saw a lot of success with that. Other thing that I saw was during establishment, if we went heavier or during the establishment time, not necessarily right at planting, but as the seedlings were starting to come on, 
If I went heavy with nitrogen that fall, we usually ended up with heavier, thicker bluegrass come that fall and into the spring. Yeah, spring. And so a little bit heavier than, than normal, maybe as much as three pounds of nitrogen in the first fall, okay. we saw really helped us out with uh, getting it going quicker. Getting it established, yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then the, on the flip side of that, with uh, the only flat out failure of Blue Muda that I've, that I've ever experienced or witnessed has been fertility related, where they continue to fertilize for the Bermuda grass, yep. heavy with ammonium sulfate during the summertime, and uh, and they basically cooked out their bluegrass yes. completely. Yep. And uh, so that's really the only failure that I've ever heard of. You're gonna have issues just like with every, there's no perfect situation. There's no silver bullet with grasses. You're gonna have problems. You're gonna experience some, some, some things that maybe we, we haven't even experienced, but, um, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we, there's been enough work done with fertility over the years that it shouldn't be a problem at this point. Go lighter, go slow releases, go organic sources, go spoon feeding, yep. especially during the summertime. Yes. Give the bluegrass a little bit of food, but don't go heavy with uh, with your, your nitrogen yep. like you normally would with Bermuda grass. You know, I, I try to make it a point to do uh, monthly soil and, and uh, foliar applications. Uh, along with uh, granular, I think uh, you know using a balanced uh, fertility program. Not I, I, the mistakes I've made in the past is over fertilizing. Uh, I don't it didn't have good success doing it that way. Um, so you know monthly soil apps, monthly foliar apps, uh, depending upon your soil types. I mean I use a lot of black gold, humic acid, uh, calcium products because we're high in mag down here. Um, I, I'd say, you know, more of a spoon feed, slow release type of fertilizer approach uh, is probably the way to go if you're if you're trying to maintain the you know. We'll put between three and four pounds of N down uh, a year. Rows we're gonna have it's a more sustainable, more predictable field is is what I would say. There's gonna be some cost savings long term. Um, you know, you're gonna get better color, you're gonna get that ability to strike that Bermuda. Um, but some of the cons, you know, if, if you're at a, a pro level or you're at a stadium that, you know, is on television, you know, sometimes, you know, that blimp shot or higher up, there, there could be some modeling across the field. Um, you know, at a lower level college, park and rec, high school, from the bleachers, you're not gonna notice that, it's more of that stadium effect where you're going to see some of that modeling across but um especially early on later on as that bluegrass comes on stronger yes. i don't think that's as much of, a, of an issue correct we i mean we've seen it at some high profile events where it looks fantastic with you know the good year flint flying over so another pro that i've, I've witnessed from my research was putting the traffic simulator on we were able to find out that the two grasses together would take more punishment or abuse than either grass on their own. And then what we saw with fall type traffic on, on Bermuda was we can get some recovery from that bluegrass during trafficking, whereas with the Bermuda grass alone, you're never going to get that. And so as fall went into winter time, we have more grass on these traffic plots than if uh, they just had Bermuda grass alone. And then certainly as we got into March, the bluegrass went crazy and filled back in was yeah. perfect, whereas the Bermuda grass wasn't going to be perfect until May. Right. And so that was a huge benefit that we saw with this was that, again, any any negatives that you're going to have with a Bermuda grass stand, not recovering or dead areas for, for whatever reason, are going to be hidden by that bluegrass. And that's yeah. such a huge, huge thing for me. We have a club that trains on it four nights a week, uh, four hours a day. and. Uh, They've been delighted with it, uh, and we still have had, had opportunity to do some games on the weekends with it. But uh, it gets tested. It has been tested throughout the summer, uh, and obviously through the fall, uh, in both cold, uh, in both you know hot season in the summer, and uh, in cooler temperatures now. And the feedback has been very positive. Cons wise, you know the initial cost is is there, right? I mean you got to factor that in. If you're yeah. a low budget, if you're not used to spending that money on ryegrass then yes, there's that initial cost. Right, and so the bluegrass seed is not cheap, no. but it's extremely small seed. And so 
a little bit goes a long, a long way. You know, 50 pound bag is going to cover a lot of the field. But you do have that initial cost to deal with. Um, after that, you know, um, that first fall grow in is painful. It doesn't look pretty like a ryegrass field would. And so maybe that's a con. Yeah. Um, but long term after that, you know, I just I don't see it. I don't have massive cons with this. Along those lines, though, is this good for anybody and everybody? Where would you cut it off in the south? Where would you cut it off in the north? And what would you give? Would you say every turf manager do this? This makes no, total sense. No, I don't know that this is for everybody. Um, you know, north. The tolerance of the Bermuda, just because you have bluegrass mixed in with it doesn't all of a sudden mean we're growing Bermuda in Canada. Like, it's not going to happen. And then, but with the newer bluegrasses, you know, to, to push that further, further south, you know, I've seen it into Oklahoma and in the, in the Norman area. Southern California has been an area where it's worked. Um, North Carolina. North Carolina. Tennessee. I mean, yes, all through the transition zone. Look at that map. It's in Alabama this year. Yeah. Not in North Alabama. Yeah. So I, I think you can stretch it further south than you can north, I guess. So, you know, even, you know, as we sit here in St. Louis, you start to get into northern Missouri and into Iowa. I don't think it's going to work. I think you're going to lose your Bermuda and your bluegrass is going to dominate. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm always interested in how much further south the bluegrasses can go. Right. But to say this is for everybody, it, it, it's not. Right. Absolutely. I think it's uh, if, if you're struggling with one grass or the other for the reasons that we've mentioned in the transition zone, um, and you've got a lot of traffic, a lot of play on your fields, like a parks and rec type situation where you just have constant abuse and your grass doesn't necessarily hold up to it, this is maybe a good situation for you to consider having the two grasses in there to, to work together to, uh, to minimize uh, thinning out from, from overuse. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're growing Bermuda, and, and especially spring sports is, is something that you have on your fields, um, this is a great system because again, it's that predictability. You, you know you're gonna have some green turf when they wanna start practice late February or early March. There's so many different micro environments at any one particular site that this combination may be very advantageous on one site and it might be perplexing to manage on another site. So one thing I'm going to, I feel really good about recommending to, to sports turf managers in the Northern Transition Zone, take a look at it. I know Dr. Munshaw has done a lot of work with, with this concept in uh, Kentucky. And I know that Mr. Winka is also very familiar with the management of these grasses together in, of all places, St. Louis, which is no easy place in which to manage turf, sports fields that are, are heavily trafficked. You, you really can't go wrong with it, you know, I, and, and I think that, you know, ultimately you're going to, it's more cost effective uh, only because you're going to save on fungicides. Uh, you know, fertility is very balanced. You know, you don't have to throw anything extra at it, you know, versus if you have just a straight, straight Bermuda field, you tend to want to nitrogen, nitrogen, you really get it cranking. You don't have to do that with the Bermuda. Um, so I, I, you know, I go in head first. I, that's kind of what we did down here. And uh, I really don't have a single complaint about it. I am confident as a facility manager to know that when we face some of our harshest uh, weather in June, late June and July, that we can rest assured that we're going to have a top rate pitch if we, you know, do the best practices of management. And that's probably the, the most comforting thing for us is that when we can sometimes have, you know, U.S. youth soccer regional event here uh, playing on our turf fields, uh, but at the same standpoint, our grass field is going to be in its best form at that period of time. Whereas on the other side, um, the bluegrass is going to allow us to get started earlier in the year, and it's also going to allow us to have a nice grass as the Bermuda starts to go dormant uh, at the end of the year. Soccer, you know, the players have, they can tell a big difference of just to them, it's just the look. You know, they, 
they don't know. I mean, they don't know anything else. But um, but if, if they're t if they're commenting on the look, then you know the, they're getting good ball roll and the playability is where it needs to be. Yeah, the, the play is great. Um, the players, coaches say that it's great it, because it's such a thin bladed grass. You know, you don't, you know, with like a Kentucky 31 fescue, you know, you get the clumps. Well, with balls rolling and then you're going to hit a clump, you're going to get, you know, deflection in all nine yards. With this, it's so, it's so evenly and it's so thin bladed that it, it just creates a carpet, which allows the ball roll. It, it just, I mean, it's great. So the players and coaches love it. Now, some examples, I had a baseball coach catch me the other day, and he said, dude, I was over at your softball field. That thing looks like Wrigley Stadium. I mean, that thing is awesome. What did you do? How did you do that? He said, a year or two years ago, that thing, everybody was complaining about it, and you had bare spots. And So I explained the situation. Of course, he's also a junior high football coach, and he said, hmm, let's do that to my practice field then. So we're in the process of rebuilding that. So I get comments like that all the time now. Like I said, my complaints – Went to compliments, and that's another one of my goals. Uh, well, I would say, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, a, it, it you, you eliminate the transition process. Uh, you know, if you have a, a Bermuda field, the transition of uh, rye grass uh, and then spraying out, and, you know, promoting the Bermuda. Um, that from that aspect, I, I think it's nice. It's it's more cost effective. From experience of being around, as the, you mentioned, the playing as a player and being around uh, different parts of the country on fields, uh, bluegrass fields, the idea was that from a layman's person was bluegrass fields look good at certain times and Bermuda fields look good in certain parts of the country. The fact that we can put those two together and have a consistent, resilient field in St. Louis and the, the kind of weather conditions we have throughout the whole year, that is not necessarily always achievable without great expense and uh, great amounts of staffing to stick with one or the other. So we feel that this, from a, even from an economic standpoint, this is actually a very affordable, uh, affordable long-term solution to have a great grass field.